I have two questions for you this morning on this Sunday. The first question is, what is happiness? The second question is, where do you find happiness? The answer to the first question, for most people, is somewhat elusive. And the reason for that is very much tied to the answer for the, of the second question. Because all too often, we look for happiness outside of ourselves and outside of our relationship with God. It's one of the biggest problems we have in modern society. People strive for happiness, and yet, find themselves having to take pills to find happiness, or perhaps drink to find happiness, or to work extensively to find success, which they think will bring happiness. All kinds of things are done, and we invest our time in people, places, and things, all in the search for happiness. And I pose that because today's gospel is very much about happiness. The word blessed that's used in the uh, Beatitudes easily could be translated happiness. This passage in Matthew's gospel is very important to understanding Matthew's gospel. It's the first real passage. Chapter 5 begins the ministry of Jesus. Up until this point, we've heard about his genealogy and about his birth and the visit of the Magi. We heard about his baptism and his temptation. And now we come to him having assembled a group of disciples and going up the mountain to teach them. St. Matthew does this because he's writing to, we believe, Jewish people so that they might come to understand who Jesus is. And to them, it would have been very apparent that Matthew is trying to make an analogy between Jesus and Moses. Moses, the most important person in the Old Testament passages, the greatest prophet and leader of Israel, who, as you well know, went up the mountain to bring back down to God's people the covenant. Jesus goes up this mount of the Beatitudes and has his disciples sit at his feet, being the great teacher, he forms an intimacy with them so that they will listen. It's not like our classrooms today where kids sit at desks and they have to take notes and they get distracted and pay attention to everything that's happening elsewhere instead of with the teacher. There was no possibility of that. Sitting so closely to the Lord, they had to focus on him and on his words. And what does he present to them? He doesn't tell them, thou shalt not this and thou shalt not that. Instead, he invites them to contemplate a new way. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, who are peacemakers, etc. Those people listening to Jesus that day had a one-word response to what he said. What? They could not have understood what he meant. And they must have scratched their heads and wondered at what he was saying. Because every group of people that he was exalting were the very people and circumstances that the people of Israel thought were fallen away somehow resulting from sinfulness, either in their own personal life or that of their family. And instead, Jesus holds them up. Now remember, it's the beginning of his ministry. 
These people were there because there was something in the voice of Jesus, something in his words, even beyond their ability to understand, that attracted them. They loved what they were hearing, even though they may not have fully understood it. And they were willing to walk with him for three years and witness how what Jesus said was actually a part of how he lived. And that's why these eight Beatitudes get passed down to us in the scriptures. Because they came to understand in the witness of Jesus' life what these words meant. We know from the Gospels that there were countless people who gave up on Jesus. They didn't understand. They didn't like what they saw. They weren't happy following him. And so they left his company. But in reality, that comes to fulfill what the prophet Zephaniah told us in the first reading, that God would raise up a remnant of faithful followers in every age. It's very much a part of the Jewish tradition that through persecution and difficulties, the people of God would be reduced in number, but always they would be in relationship with God. They would be faithful, at least he would be faithful to them, and they would try and struggle to be faithful to him. St. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, is dealing with a community wherein people who believed were beginning to walk away, going back to their former pre-Christian ways because they weren't happy. And St. Paul writes to them and says, remember your calling. Remember that God chose the foolish to shame the wise. He chose the weak to shame the strong. He chose those who in society counted for nothing to shame those who thought themselves something. How beautiful St. Paul's words. And how much we need to actually reflect on them. And so you have homework this week. This is like a class. And your homework is actually very simple. Pick just one of the Beatitudes and take time to contemplate it. And then search your mind or actually open up the scriptures and read some of the gospel passages and find an example where Jesus brings to life that Beatitude. And then practice what Jesus did. Practice it over and over and over again until it becomes a part of you, your second nature. And then move on and pick a second beatitude. And then the third, all the way through all eight of them. Because once they become part of your life, part of your lived experience, you will understand better what it means to be a disciple. Your life will likely be no easier than it is today. But it will be happy. And you will understand the words that conclude the gospel. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven.